I have spoken before about how an inmate's electronics, his appliances, can drastically alter the quality of his life. The example that I used was an acquaintance of mine, Billy. He had arranged to trade 100 lunches to Scooby in exchange for a television. This meant he was going to be hungry, just a little hungry. I mean, they feed you reasonably well in prison. He wasn't going to starve, but he was going to be hungry every day for over three months. This may seem like a heavy price to pay for a television, but in my mind, this was a wise choice on his part. He was planning long term. He was a lifer. And if you have a television and you maintain it, care for it, they can last three, five, seven years quite easily. In prison, you may be in your cell for a day, a week. On some yards, you'll be in your cell for a month or even a year while you're on lockdown. If you don't have a television or a radio, you're not a reader, well, you're just there, and you're going to stare at a wall for hours and hours every day. Boredom. It might seem like a trivial complaint in the context of prison. Most people think about the riot where you might get stabbed, or getting a terrible celly who might kill or rape you as the thing that's terrifying about prison, and they're right. But if you do a little bit of time, you realize that the boredom wears at you, it grinds you down. And if you don't find a way to keep your mind occupied, you lose little pieces of yourself day by day just staring at that wall waiting for your prison term to end. So a television, a radio, anything to keep yourself occupied is a wise investment, especially if you're a lifer like Billy was. Of course, television and radio, I'm leaving out CD player or something that you can listen to your own music that you've purchased, and you were allowed to do that. In CDC, you were allowed to own up to 10 CDs at a time. So what you would do is if you had a genre of music that you liked, perhaps country or rock, rap, classical music, whatever it might be, you'd assemble a couple of CDs in that genre and you'd ask around and there'd be somebody who would let you listen to one of theirs in exchange for listening to one of yours. You put a lot of thought into the 10 CDs that you were allowed to purchase over the course of the years. So did they. As a result, in every building you'd have a pretty decent collection of just about every style of music if you asked around and figure out who listened to what. I remember hearing a story, and it may be apocryphal. It has the hallmarks of an urban legend. But I remember being told that up until the 80s, you were allowed to get records in prison and that there was one gentleman in San Quentin who had arranged to have a big cabinet record player sent in. All the way up into the 90s, the story went, he'd managed to hold on to his cabinet record player and his collection of records by keeping it under his bed, covered up with a blanket, and only listening to it whenever he was sure the cops weren't in the building. This may or may not be true, but it speaks to the, the care and the close thought that inmates put into establishing and maintaining their music collection. I always liked the idea of this inmate keeping his records as everybody else moved on to cassettes and then CDs. Later MP3 players were allowed in prison. And finally tablets. I remember being in the canteen line at the California Institution for Men in Chino. And I was waiting to get my canteen and started talking about the new tablets that they were going to be selling because they had passed out the package catalogs that would let us know what we'd be allowed to buy in the next package. My two friends, Mr. Fisher, Dutch, and myself, sat down with our canteen. We had a bag of chips, a couple of sodas, and candy bars. And we looked at the pictures of the tablets that were in the various package catalogs and tried to guess from the little blurb what they would actually be like to have. It was such a foreign concept, an electronic device like a phone. Of course, they weren't allowed to call out, but I was excited about word processing software. I thought it might have a notepad or Microsoft Word, and maybe if we were really lucky, they'd arrange some way for us to put it on an SD card and send it home. As it turned out, eventually they did set up an email program on some of the tablets, but whenever they passed out these first tablets, whenever I was there in 2013 or so, 
there were no word processing programs or anything like that. It was music and games, and the thing Mr. Fisher was most excited about was books. He hit the nail on the head on this one. He said he was so tired of having to carry around to the books that he loved from prison to prison because he didn't want to be without them. But if he had them on a tablet, well, then he could just keep loading them and they'd be there forever for him. He was a lifer and he didn't expect he was ever going to be out of prison. So keeping track of all of the books that you want to read and having them in one place, this was such an opportunity for him and he was excited about it. He got a tablet from Union Supply because it came preloaded with, I believe, 100 pieces of classical literature that were outside of copyright so they could be provided to inmates for free. Some of these were books that everybody knows about, Dante's Inferno, Les Miserables. But what was more interesting was some of the stuff that I guess just got put onto the tablet because they didn't know what else to put on. I remember seeing a collection of most interesting newspapers from the past hundred years that had gotten put into a book. Mr. Fisher, every time I'd walk past his bunk, I'd ask him, hey man, what are you reading now? And he'd always have something interesting that he was reading on his tablet. Dutch, my other friend who was also my bunkie, he was excited about the games. He'd apparently been a gamer prior to his arrest and had only been incarcerated for a couple of years. I think it was Gears of War, he said that was his favorite game, and he was apparently turn tournament ranked or something like that, where he played it all day long in his adolescence. Well, once we got the tablets, he played a game called Andor's Trail. It was a dinky little role-playing game, but I think he put about eight hours a day into that thing in the time that I knew him, and if there was a way to be tournament ranked in Andor's Trail, I guarantee you he would have been at the top of the rankings, because he treated it like a job. Of course, music was how we started this conversation, and there were so many people who, they had the same logic as Mr. Fisher. Songs are two bucks a piece, but if I buy a couple hundred songs, a couple thousand songs, and put them on my tablet, I'll have them for forever. Even if the tablet gets broken or lost, I can tell Union Supply I want to buy a new tablet, and they'll replace the songs and all the media that I bought, because it's on my receipt. Of course, as it turned out, there was a security flaw in some of the tablets. Inmates figured out how to use SD cards in order to put photos onto the tablets. They were able to put pornographic photos, photos they had sent from home, anything like that, so long as they were able to get it onto an SD card with a contraband cell phone. In and of itself, this might not have been too big of a security risk. Inmates, of course, aren't allowed to possess pornography, and you're not allowed to hack into the OS of the tablet because you realized that it's basically an Android device. But there was no real exigent security threat, except that somebody might be able to put the bad news list, the code books, all of these tiny little kites that inmates transfer from institution to institution, written on itty bitty pieces of paper, folded up, and then hidden in such a manner that you could get through a strip search. Well, they wouldn't have to do that anymore. They would just take these photos and put them on the tablet. Once a squad member pointed out that this was an exigent security threat, they came out and rounded up all of the tablets just a little while after I paroled. Replaced them with something that was more secure called a JPEG tablet. I don't know anything about these new tablets, except that they apparently can do video chat under some circumstances, which is really cool for an inmate. But by and large, I think of the guys who planned ahead. They were planning long term, same as Billy was, thinking of, well, I'm going to be down a long time, so if I spend a bunch of money, everything I can get my hands on, on this music right now, I'll never have to pay for it again. Whenever you're looking at the downhill ride of a 20, 30, 40 year term, I mean, you know you're not getting out of prison. The idea that you can buy something and have it for the rest of your life in your hand, well, that's a real sell. And they were wrong, because there is no sure thing in life. They thought it was a sure thing, but as it turns out, there was a security threat and the cops took it. It always says, whenever you buy anything in prison, hey look, if there's a security threat, if somebody figures out how to make this thing into a knife, we're going to come and take it from you. That's an understood rule and a reasonable rule. It's just this time it screwed a lot of people. There are guys in CDC still walking around today crying about the $1,000 tablet that they had taken by the cops. 
of course, that speaks to our everyday lives. That situation isn't unique to prison. I think we've all had the experience where we told ourselves this thing, whatever it might be, is going to be the last one of these that I need to get. Whether it was a tablet or a car. And then whenever you got it, well, it didn't work out. Maybe it wore down or it was stolen. And suddenly you're left having to reconsider the scenario that you had in your head. You thought it was a sure thing, but it fell apart and now you're going to have to get another. Because there are no sure things in life. That's why we don't put all our eggs in one basket like the guys with the tablets were doing. Nothing is guaranteed. Not the tablet or your car or your house, your job, your freedom, your health or your life. There are no guarantees. It can all be taken from you at an instant's notice. And that's why it's so important that we meet every day with the awe and reverence that we would treat it if we knew it were our last. It might be. Thank you for listening today.